All right. Good morning, Tom Waters. How are you? Fine. How are you? Good. Well, as a sort of a long-haired semi-criminal filmmaker in, in uh, Baltimore in 1969-1970, what kind of images did San Francisco conjure up in your mind? Well, I, you know, at the summer, I remember in San Francisco, the first thing I heard about was the summer of love, which sounded horrible to me, you know. Um, I was an yippie, not a hippie. Um, to me, I like to go to the riots because all the boys look cute throwing bombs and stuff. So I went to San Francisco for the first time, um, and I didn't know one person. I drove my car there. I went with David Lockery. And we... I got a roommate that I didn't know named Dan Wiles, and he told me about the Palace Theater that showed great midnight movies on the weekends. And I had made multiple maniacs and Mondo Trash of them. This was before Pink Flamingos. So I brought them out there. Maybe I had only made Mondo Trash, or I can't remember. Um, no, I had made them both, I think. And uh, so I went to the Palace Theater to see one of these movies, and I think that's when I first saw the Cockettes, which were really radical at the time because they were the first kind of like bearded drag queens. They were like hippie acid freak drag queens, which was really new at the time. It still would be new. But, um, and it was, at the same time, they showed great midnight movies. It was usually a coquette show and a midnight movie. The audience was what I remember even more than any of it. Was every person was tripping, stoned. It was completely the end of the love movement. <laughs> Here it was. It was really kind of punk before punk ever happened. Except they were hippies. The, 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 certainly the Cockettes were deranged hippies. And uh, it was really great for me because uh, then I met Sebastian who booked the whole thing and, and was the sort of the brains behind all these shows. And he told me, let's bring Divine out to San Francisco. I thought, what a great idea. He was going to pay for the ticket, right? Divine at the time, I guess in Divine's mind was still Glenn Milstead. He hadn't switched over to being, in his mind, divine all the time. He had been divine in my movies, but in his real life, he didn't believe yet anything was going to come from these movies. So he was in Provincetown without one nickel to his name. He had recently, with Cookie Muller, they didn't have a Christmas tree, they didn't have any money, so they sawed down the Christmas tree on the sheriff's lawn and took it home fully decorated. So he had to get out of town, right? said, come to San Francisco. All he had was the air ticket. Not one nickel in his purse. Got in full drag, got on the airplane alone, and flew to San Francisco, and the Coquettes met him in a big media event. He flipped over. He was divine forever then. He never went back to being Glenn Milstead after that night. And what was that appearance like at the... The first time, I'm trying to remember, we would show probably Mondo, well, I think Mondo Trash Show had been shown already. So the audience and Multiple Maniacs probably successfully, maybe with Coquette shows, threw Sebastian at the Palace Theater at midnight. So the underground community in San Francisco knew my movies. It was the first place my movies ever caught on outside of Baltimore and Provincetown. And it was great because it was this incredible audience. First of all, it was a lot of people came. And um, Sebastian paid me, and it was great. I had a way to make some money and to pay back my father, actually, who lent me the money to make these movies. And it was a great success financially for me because um, I forget. I mean, you got $100 or something, a dollar a minute, I think, was the going rate at the time, which was great. It was a lot then because everyone, no one worked then. Everybody got welfare or stole. Stealing was politically correct at the time, you have to remember. So this was in, the, in, a, in a movement of... Of really, it was terrorists the Coquettes were in a way. Certainly sexual terrorists. And Divine was a terrorist too, I think, sexually. I mean, here he was like in making anti-hippie movies. Certainly Multiple Maniacs was a movie that glorified violence in a time where that was really a no-no. Hippies were horrified. I mean, Divine in that movie took the credit of the Sharon Tate murders before they caught Manson. We said we did it which was not real politically correct within the summer of love, believe me. And, uh, but when Divine got there, he had kindred spirits, certainly, in the Cockettes, who maybe the, they loved Divine, and they were really welcomed him in with open arms. So it was a really big point in both Divine and my life at the time. And Sebastian and the Palace Theater were the, really the first time it caught on. How do you think it worked? I mean, it, the aesthetic of your films was so totally contrary to what San Francisco was about at the mm -hmm. time. And certainly the Coquettes had nothing remotely violent in any of their things. Mm -hmm. What do you think it was that drew the Coquettes to Divine? And why did the audience at that particular point in time respond to your uh, highly different kind of vision? 
Well, certainly Divine was a beauty extremist, you would say. Um, I think that Divine had such an outrageous look that the Coquettes respected his fashion sense. I think that was the main thing. The Coquettes loved to shock, too. They broke taboos with nudity and sexual gender thing and everything, and Divine did the same thing. The violent stuff, to them, they knew it was humor. I mean, later I wrote a show for Divine, The Misdemeanor Show, where he came out with, and Van Smith had a lot to do with this, who did Divine's makeup and costumes at the time. D uh, Van would put fake scars all over his face, and Divine would come out carrying an axe, and I wrote him this long monologue about how he um, followed hippies to their house and like would go in and kill their girlfriends and their pets and then eat white sugar. You know, everything that you could never do in San Francisco. But everyone laughed because they knew that it was a, it was a comic act. But yes, we were the opposite of everything that San Francisco believed in at the time. A lot of people who we've talked to have really remembered that speech. Right. Vividly. <laughs> that Divine gave at the misdemeanor beauty pageant. Right. Was, the, was that a Coquette's event or was it... It was in the People's Temple, for one thing, before the People's Temple, in that exact building where the People's Temple, uh, later when that happened, I thought, oh, I was there, I was in the People's Temple. Um, and I don't remember, the Coquettes, it was a little after the Coquettes, I think, or I'm sure that they were there. There were other Coquettes that were, it was a beauty pageant, but it wasn't at the Palace Theater. So this was, I think, after the Palace Theater kind of thing had maybe been over with. But I can't remember, actually. Mm -hmm. I know Mink came out and worked with the, with the Cockettes, too, certainly. But the Cockettes, there were so many fringes. You know, there were cults that would break away. And I was always on the Cockettes side. I know I lived in this commune there called Flow Airwaves. And next door was Hungadunga, which was, I think, the... Um, Angels of Light, some of them, Sheeper, Irving Rosenthal, and that guy. And they were very serious about no sugar. So we would do terrorist raids and dump white sugar on their, on their doorsteps late at night because we were much more into breaking hippie rules, too. I thought there was even more rules in the hippie community than there was in straight society. So um, I wanted to do things like the weathermen were my heroes, you know. And basically, um, I was for cultural terrorism, which we were trying to do with Divine, who I think was in some ways a cultural terrorist. Eating shit and drag is something that still no one has ever tried to do again. No one will ever do it again. It was a meaningless first. But it was terrorism of sorts, cultural terrorism. And I think the Cuckettes respected that. Now, when they first saw Divine, he had only eaten a cow heart, because in Multiple Maniacs, he murders David Lockery, rips out a cow heart, and eats it. And the sad thing was, I left it out, and it was thawed, and it was rotten, kind of. So Divine starts gagging, but he still eats it. So and I think the Coquettes respected that, because the Coquettes liked to, in San Francisco talk, blow people's minds, and so did Divine. And it was in a very, very different way, but their sensibilities certainly teamed up. And pot had a lot to do with it. They were all potheads. Divine was a huge pothead then. And acid, it was drug-fueled. The audience, 100% of them, were, was on drugs at the Palace Theater. No one didn't take drugs that was on stage or in the audience. And what was the ap atmosphere like? When you first went to the first Cockettes show, did you see films first and then the Cockettes came on stage? Did you know the Cockettes were going to be? I think, yeah, I think the Cockettes show was always first and then the film happened. Um, and I saw movies like The World Greatest Sinner, a movie that I saw there that to this day I remember that I've never seen before or since that Sebastian found somewhere. He later had The Secret Cinema, which was a, movie, a great movie theater in a loft. I don't know how legally he ever got away with it because it advertised in the paper. It was a real movie theater, but it was in someone's house. She just came in. Um, that was sort of an offshoot of after the palace's success. The first time I went there, I remember thinking, this is really, really new. I have never seen this before. It was insane hippie drag queens on and off the stage, but anarchy, true anarchy in the theater. I mean, people were having sex, people were nude, you couldn't tell if it was men or women, it was straight people too, it was complete sexual anarchy, which is always a wonderful thing. Absolutely. Um, okay, let me pause for a second here. You saw early shows, cockhead shows, and Hibiscus was in the shows at that point still. Mm -hmm. I guess. I probably, they were, I didn't get there. I'm sure I didn't see the first Coquette show. When I arrived to the, in San Francisco, the Coquettes were already known because I went to, was taken to their show. So it wasn't like the first one or anything. But I don't know. I can't remember when or... Did you know Hibiscus? Did you meet Hibiscus? I met Hibiscus. I didn't know any of them when I first went there. Um, 
I did know hibiscus. I knew better, certainly, Sylvester, I think, I knew very well. And Sylvester used to come over to our apartment and really tell me about his dreams. He, he was the one with the, really the most talent, probably, of all the coquettes. And I'm not saying that in a mean way, but certainly Sylvester could really, really sing. But I knew Tahara, I knew Scrumbly, I knew all of them, and then we would see him at the Stud. The Stud bar was the, and it, that sounds like some leather bar, it wasn't a leather bar. It was a hippie gay bar, and it was the first hippie gay bar ever, which was pretty radical, where gay people weren't square anymore. They finally, they took drugs, they looked like lunatics, they had sex in the bathroom, uh, you could hang out with girls, you could do, you could break all the rules of gay society. And the stud was the hangout for the coquettes also. So not only would I meet them at the palace, you would also socialize them. We went to um, coquette parties. There was, um, and we stole together. Everybody stole. It was really politically correct to shoplift and to steal things for show. I stole film from my shows. They stole sets, costumes. Everybody did. It was a very time of complete anarchy in San Francisco. And most, many people got ATD, aid to the totally disabled. I was turned down. They told me I was insane, but not permanently. So all I got was welfare. But I remember once getting an emergency food voucher and buying like $100 worth of crab meat with it and having the people, the women behind me in the supermarket line flipping out, rightfully so, and going crazy. But in those days, the welfare workers would say, oh, don't put that down. They were cockheads, it seemed like. It was a, a city, very, very radical city at the time. And it still is a great radical city. But you could live there. I don't know how anyone lived. No one I knew worked ever. We worked on our own projects. We were busy, but work was not exactly... Who could get a job looking like that? I mean, everybody looked fairly insane at the time. I mean, it's so dramatically different from now. I mean, the whole notion of being willing to be categorized as totally insane by the government is something that most people would not consider a viable option now. Well, getting ATD was like winning the Oscar in San Francisco. When you got it, because I know people that got it then that are still on it. You can't not get it. You can't be cut out of, of ATD. And, and I'm not baiting this. I shouldn't say that because I think most of the people, if they still get it, probably do deserve it. Um, but I remember having to go to a shrink and fake the whole thing and acting insane and everything. And I blew it because at the end, he said, if you could be anything in the world, what do you want to be? And I stupidly said a writer, and then he knew I was lying. I should have said, you know, an astronaut or you. I should have said, you know. I'm always thinking it was just the worst wrong answer I said to him. But um, getting ATD was a cultural grant. It was a grant, actually, from the government to continue your insane lifestyle in the arts in San Francisco. So ATD was a good thing. It just maybe wasn't what the government originally planned for it. Was coming into San Francisco in that time, in that environment, in, akin in any way to like going through a looking glass? I mean, was it that different of a world? Was it that? isolated from reality. Well, I was coming from a very different world, certainly in Baltimore was its own insane world of um, drugs and drag and straight boys and terrorists and everybody hanging out together. So it was a, the West Coast version of it, certainly. But I went there to break those rules of hippie rules. You know, hippies always got on my nerves. They still do. New age, I loathe. You know, um, keep those crystals away from me and keep that brown rice away from me in the old days. Um, so basically, I like to defy hippies. And, but that was the key to any success I had, is being politically incorrect. They didn't have that term. And within the hippie, making fun of hippie values, which is certainly what Multiple Maniacs and Pink Flamingos did. But that was the audience, of course, was hippies, but lunatic hippies, not the liberal kind. Were you aware of the, the tension that happened with the cauliflower people? Well, I knew something. I knew that there was a split between, supposedly, and I might be remembering this wrong, because this is from a time, a long time ago, when everybody was pretty nuts that the, supposedly the Angels of Light said that they started it, then it became the Cockettes. It turned too commercial, if you can imagine such a thing. And the Angels of Life went off in the, in the light, went off in the non-commercial way, and the Cockettes continued to be the commercial aspect of it, supposedly that they stole it from the Angels of Light. I was probably on the Cockette side. I was more of a coquette hag than an angel of light hag. Because the angel of lights were like too serious about being hippies. And they, had, they were so politically correct in the hippie world that I enjoyed baiting that, actually. But I, I liked Hibiscus. I knew him later. You know, I, I knew some of them and liked a lot of them. 
but it was you know i really wanted to live in the spawn ranch then so so to me they were two good hippies i like bad hippies and i think the coquettes were the bad ones and the angels of light were the quote good ones as far as like hippily correct who did you get to be best friends with within the coquette circle did you socialize with them? i socialized with them i don't know i was never best friends with any of them i i think tahara i remember very very fondly goldie glitters who was Divine's friend. Goldie hung out with Divine a lot, so I knew Goldie. I knew Scrumbly very, very well at the time, but I think who I, who I got closer to was probably Sylvester, because Sylvester, I remember, used to come over to our house when I lived with Dan Wiles and have dinner and talk about his plans, and um, we used to talk about music all the time because we liked the same kind of music. But I knew them all socially, certainly Grasshopper, who, who wasn't really a coquette, but he was in the criminal aspect that I liked, that hung around the coquettes. Um, it was a whole scene that everybody joined to. My dearest friends in San Francisco were certainly Giles and Timmy, and unfortunately Timmy is no longer with us, but Giles lives in San Francisco and took all the photos of Divine that were in my book at the Coquettes uh, reunion, uh, you know, the first time they met the Coquettes with Divine. David Spencer, who we all lived with at the time. Um, but Mink came out, she was in the Coquettes. Uh, Fayette, I remember very, very fondly. Um, and, you know, I see their pictures you show me and I completely remember, but I get everyone's name mixed up because I really haven't seen these people for almost 30 years, I guess. Did Sylvester consider himself a Coquette? Yes, but Sylvester thought of himself as probably, in not a mean way ever did he say this, but that he knew he was going to go beyond the Coquettes. He was going to be more than the Coquettes. That he, he was the most talented one. That was the cliche. Everybody knew that Sylvester had the most talent of all the Coquettes, or that was the legend. And uh, he, he was proud of being the Coquettes, but I think it became the Coquettes and special guest star Sylvester. So I think Sylvester probably always thought he was a little bit bigger than the Coquettes, or was going to become that. But they like Sylvester. I mean, I mean, the Coquettes, very, I never heard them say anything bad about Sylvester. Um, they were proud because they knew that he would come out and do these torch numbers, these solo numbers that were, were truly amazing. Did they fit in with the rest of the show? Yes, they did fit in with the rest of the show because Busby Berkeley was, I think, the hugest influence on the Coquettes. And I remember when I first saw those movies, they were, they were very new to me when I first saw them. They were a big revival of Busby Berkeley. So these were insane Busby Berkeley ones. And then it would stop with one big solo number. And uh, no, it made the show very, um, even more, the professional aspect of it was seemed to be Sylvester. Um, hold on, let me take a do you remember which, would you remember by names any of the shows that you might have seen? If you say them, I would remember, maybe. Well, Tropical Heat Wave, Hot Voodoo. Hot Voodoo, I think I saw. Tro I, I might have seen Tropical, I mean, I, I, the ones I remember, the ones later that Divine did, with like Vice Palace, and, uh, but certainly, give me some more names. Well, Divine performed in Journey to the Center of Uranus. And I think I was not in San Francisco when that one was. Because, see, I would go back and try to get the money for the movies in between or go work in Provincetown in the summer so I could get unemployment to also get me out to, back to San Francisco. Did the rest of your crowd hang out in San Francisco most of that period of time, or was there also a lot of back and forth? There was back and forth, but certainly Van Smith moved to San Francisco. Ming Stoll lived in San Francisco. Mary Vivian Pierce came to visit me there with Danny Mills, but they didn't stay. Uh... Who else? Uh, Vince Perennio, I don't think, was there. Susan Lowe was there. Um, Van and Mink, I think, were the people that were there the longest time. And Susan Lowe came out there. When Divine came out for the Mondo Trash of screening, mm -hmm. he went back. It might have been Multiple Maniacs. I don't remember which one. I think it was Multiple Maniacs. I think they showed Mondo first so everybody knew who he was, or maybe the other way around. I don't remember. Did he go back? I don't know. Probably. I think he just came for that weekend, but I don't remember. He might have just stayed because we just would do that. Just, oh, I like it here. Let's live here. But I, I don't remember. Do you remember what no, Divine? No, just in Hollywood. Okay. Oh, we forgot that. Hollywood's a big nipple. Oh, yeah, right. New York is a big apple and Hollywood's a big nipple. Mm-hmm. Um, what was Divine's sense of the Coquettes? at the time when he first met them? I think he was thrilled to be recognized, and they, they looked very much up to him when he first came there. He was like kind of 
this little legend that came, and they were really excited about it. And the, the Cockcuts were very welcoming and very, uh, they loved him, and he loved him right back because he had never had that support from this cult, really. And it was, we had a cult, and they had a cult, and it was nice for these weird showbiz cults to meet. Um, and I think he liked working them without me because I think um, that gave him something that people could say that he could do on his own. And when I wasn't making a movie, he continued to work and be involved in stuff. And I think that was very important to him. Do you remember what he did at that appearance? Of well, of the yes. Movie? The first thing we always did with the Cockats is I would come on stage in the beginning and speak a little bit and then saying, now I'd like to introduce the most beautiful woman in the world. And Divine would come out pushing a shopping cart filled with dead mackerels. And then we had Timmy Giles and Chan Wilroy, who was also out there, played his fans, photographers, and they would just be snapping pictures of him while he threw um, dead fish into the audience. But we choreographed it. So they would open their legs and Divine would crawl through. They would do all this kind of choreographed act, taking Divine's picture with him having exhibitionist fits that we later put in Female Trouble. He would uh, rip a phone book in half. And then the act always ended when we would go and steal. We'd rent and never take it back this, from a costume place, a policeman's uniform, and then get some hippie with a short-haired wig to play the cop. And at the end, Divine would be flipping out on stage, having glamour fits, and the fake cop would come out to try to arrest him, and Divine would strangle him to death. That was our closing act, our nightclub act. So, and we did it later in other cities, so all, our only star demands was 10 dead mackerels that had to be waiting in the dressing room. Now today, people would get furious if a dead mackerel hit you in some like Prada outfit or something. You can imagine, but then they just throw it back and it was, so that was our act, that was our nightclub act, yes. And the audience? They seemed yeah. to go for it, yeah, they went crazy. Because Divine would start sh saying this, hideous monologues that I would write about I am the most beautiful woman in the world and I you know I don't remember I killed this person I did people go whoa you know this is everything that we're not supposed to laugh about here but um, they did like it they did like it and um, and then divine adored their whole thing this whole star system they had this whole thing about this outrageous fashion sense that divine really was one of the first people that had that beside the cockettes and I think they both respected each other's severity in uh, in fashion. And I mean, the Cockettes, their whole life was spent like getting together these outfits and building these sets and going to thrift shops. I mean, going to thrift shops was a ritual. It was, an, it was um, people practically chanted when they did it. And stealing clothes, you know, there was always different fag hags that would steal each other's clothes, like wars between, hey, that's my, I know one girl that was, friend of us and she got committed and then when she got out of the mental institution she saw all other fag hags wearing her outfits that they had broken into her apartment and stolen things like that which really made daily life exciting at the time well, it's also this incredible contradiction with the hippie stuff that people were fishing each other to filth stealing each other's things and there's all of this amazing bitchiness too well, I didn't remember bitchiness. I guess there was coquette wars with each other, who's the most famous, and I remember Divine being involved in that some. But generally, I didn't see that much of that. I mean, I, the coquettes I knew all, they were a group. They were this band of, like, it was like vaudeville is what it was like. And some were stars and some were but they also, I never saw the feuds and everything, except with the Angels of Light thing, but that was sort of later. In the beginning, they were all together, and it was this band of, pirates of, of 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 kind of insane exhibitionist hippies the drugs really had a huge amount to do with it it's something that you can never imagine today going somewhere where every person on the stage and in the audience was on drugs i mean that's <laughs> these weren't reviewed very seldomly i mean uh it was a totally word of mouth thing the real people didn't even know about it yet and if you if they managed to come there they would be horrified and they would say what the hell is this and I know later Allen Ginsberg went there and then he took I think Truman Capote I heard and, and other people I know David Hockney went to see it so word spread in the in the homosexual international world that if you were in San Francisco you won't you'll be shocked when you see this and that's why it was so great because it wasn't like that in any other city at the time they didn't have this this weird madness, the shared madness that going to the Palace Theater was. I don't think anywhere else had that effect. I know that they used to have New Year's Eve shows. I have a poster in my house at home for it, bimbos or somewhere, like they had a New Year's Eve extravaganza. They were good, but they were not the same as the Palace. The Palace, and I always wondered what the 
Chinese owners of the Palace Theater that in the day showed all Chinese films. It was only on midnight they had these insane events. During the week, it was a ch regular Chinese movie theater. What did they think? Did they ever come in and look? Because I know Sebastian just would rent it for those, th that time period. What could they have possibly thought was going on here? And the police never came that I heard of. Talk about breaking of every zoning law, every possible thing, violation was going on in here. Um, how did Divine feel in later years, looking back on the whole experience with the cockheads? I don't think he's been very favorable about the cockheads. I don't think he ever, he always wondered where Goldie was. You know, he looked back at Lana very fondly. I don't think he had a bad memory at all of the cockheads. At the time Andy Warhol was making, and Paul Morris, who were making their movies with the East Coast drag queens, Women in Revolt, and, and Heat, and, and mm -hmm. Chelsea Girls, all of that period, how did you see this sort of difference in aesthetic and underlying value system, and et cetera, between what was going on in New York and going uh, on in San Well, see, when I was in Baltimore, the New York underground was very closed minded. They didn't want anybody from, you had to be from New York. Nowadays, you can come from anywhere they like. But then I had Mondo Trashel and Multiple Maniacs had never been screened in New York till after Pink Flamingos became a hit. So San Francisco certainly discovered them much earlier. Um, though I loved, I used to run away from home and go see the Chelsea girls. I mean, uh, Mario Montez was probably one of the first drag queens I ever remember. But Bridget Berlin was the big star to me in the Warhol film because she was a big girl. And certainly that had an influence on Divine being the star of my movie. Um, but we were making these movies that were very different than the Warhol movies, but certainly the Warhol movies were, I love them, but mine were scripted. They were more narrative. They had a beginning, middle, and end, sort of. Uh, and, but they were filmed with very much the same kind of equipment. Technically, they were very, very similar. Um, but I had never met Andy then. I didn't meet Andy till Pink Flamingos. I didn't meet Paul till Pink Flamingos. So basically... It was three very, very different types of thing. Uh, the Warhol thing defined New York coolness, certainly, in my opinion. Mine was influenced by nudist camp movies, Ingmar Bergman and um, the underground movement all put together. I think um, that with a Baltimore twist on it, on purposely making these trashy movies that, that were exploitation movies probably was the biggest influence for me. And in San Francisco which has always been a great movie town, but a movie town like no other. You can have something that's a hit in San Francisco and it is not a hit anywhere else, like the movie Freeway. Um, that happens a lot in San Francisco. You can't predict what's going to be a success there. Um, they had this very original scene also that was almost like an offshoot of the hippie movement, but in a much more insane way, that hippies would have been scared of the cockettes. And certainly, this was before gay liberation, almost. This was very, very radical for the time, to have a bearded drag queen on drugs. Just, there was no world that could accept that. Hippies were scared of it. The left wing was scared of it. But it combusted, and it became this very, very liberating thing for, for many people, I think. I mean, you were existing. All of this was going on as... I mean... Ready? As this was going on, I mean, you had Kent State happening, you had Altamont had just happened, you have Nixon, you have Vietnam, you have incredible political energy, and you have, this is just after Stonewall. What was the connection, the relationship between the Coquettes kind of scene and the sort of larger political realities of the time? I don't remember the Coquettes discussing Kent State, let's put it that way. But it had a huge influence on it because of these demonstrations every day and rabble rousing and terrorism and being, you, a war was going on within the country culturally. And it was certainly a part of that. It was about drugs. It was about, um, I remember once in San Francisco, I went to some of the greatest demonstrations there. I saw people rolling over a Rolls Royce down one of the hills, which I'll never forget that image. I also saw, who was the main leader of Vietnam that, how do you say it? K.Y. is his name? Key. Key, right. Well, he came out and spoke or something, and they had passed out literature how to say Key sucks dicks in Vietnamese, and everybody started going, oh, no, that it was like so insane. So it was humor had such a big part of demonstrations in San Francisco with the yippies and with everything that the coquettes became, I think, had to be influenced by that, by the rabble-rousing of the time. And they, just by walking down the street and going out and showing up in anything, was a political statement completely. It was the beginning of gay liberation. 
Did they get hostility from people on the streets? I mean, I'm sure they did. I mean, Divine, I've seen walk down the street and cause a car accident, like Jane Mansfield and the girl camp, where people just like looking like this and rear-ending another car. Um, I don't know. In San Francisco, which is always probably the most liberal city, I, if they were ever gay bashed or anything, I have no idea. I can imagine that they, seeing Goldie Glitters just walking down the corner to get a pack a carton of milk might have been hassled in his life. But certainly in the times, I don't think the hippies hassled him. I don't think um, the Black Panthers beat up Goldie Glitters. I think that probably there was, you know, extreme straight people somewhere that might have. But I don't remember that being a hassle. I don't remember... Um, no, I remember going out to be a fashion show and a political statement and an act of courage. But I don't remember ever being frightened to go out in San Francisco with anybody, ever. Tell me a little about Goldie. Well, Goldie maybe was not the most beautiful as a woman. Certainly, sometimes Goldie looked like a man still. But Goldie lived in drag. Divine never, ever lived in drag. Goldie was always halfway, you know, he might have a beard, but he had on lashes. Um, Goldie lived more as a woman, certainly, than many of the coquettes did. Divine didn't ever get in drag, except he might wear a pair of earrings and a janitor's uniform. That was Divine's look, and a day-old beard, and his hair shaved back like that, and a big diamond ring. Um, that was Divine's at-home look. But Goldie was in plays with him and everything, and Goldie was a very dedicated coquette. Maybe he didn't have the greatest acting talent or anything, but you couldn't tell on the shows because they were so purposely cheesy and over the top and like j exaggerated Busby Berkeley musicals. How can, you know, what's the difference between good and bad acting in them? But Goldie, I just remember as being always around a lot, always around, and um, was almost like Divine's, not a fan, but 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 Divine took Goldie under his wing a little bit. It seemed to me. Goldie may not remember it that way. But they were friends. I'm sure they argued. But they didn't compete ever. Let's put it that way. Well, actually, we talked to a choreographer yeah. who choreographed the two of them in a number, and she said it was absolute <laughs> hell. The two of them got in this unbelievable battle. Oh, they did. The See, I wasn't around for any of those rehearsals. Because I never did a coquette show. I was never involved in... A Cockett's production ever. I was in the audience, and we were also the, a, a different act on the same bill, basically. So, oh, I can, I'm sure, believe me. But I, I never saw them fight. They, they always used to um, bicker, I think. But I never saw them have a real fight. But. Do you remember anybody particular other than Sylvester who you thought was talented, John Rock? Do you remember anybody else particularly as a stage presence? John Rothermel, for instance, or... See, if I saw them, I'm so bad on names, but if I okay. saw their faces, yes. I mean, Scrumbly, I remember, and who was the woman he was always with? Sweet Pam. Sweet Pam. Those two seemed to be the ringleaders. They seemed to be um, also some of the most talented ones in the Cockettes. And I remember them being on stage the most and featured very, very heavily. And they seemed to me to be one of the main people that kept the Cockettes together. I may be totally wrong. But that is my memory of it, that they were also very, very talented. Do you have any recollections of Trisha's wedding? No, because, I mean, I saw the movie. It was right after we made Multiple Maniacs, and it was even on some bills together, I think, certainly. Um, I thought the funniest thing is I had made the Diane Linkletter story. And I think that had something to do with Trisha's wedding, you know, which was basically make a movie immediately when it happens. And they opened it the day of her wedding. And um, we had, unfortunately, the Diane Linkler story was in the theaters before the funeral. So basically, it was in that school of instant movies, which I tell when I do all my college lectures today, why don't you make Eddie Murphy Chicks with Dick story? Why don't you make... Uh, Monica and the Presidential Load. You know, you got all these things that could be great drag queen movies. I mean, Monica is a part that is begs for a drag queen to play it. So, so basically, it's a genre that has ended, and there was probably only two, Trisha's Wedding and the Diane Linkletter story, the two instant movies. And you had to have them finish, edited, and in the theater before the event even happened, or the day of it. Because I remember in Variety there was an article with Trisha's Nick Wedding where... They offered Trisha Nixon like to give a huge amount of money to charity if she would come or have her opinion. I forget, but it was really, I think, played the same day as her real wedding. 
that was terrorism. You see what I mean? That was basically something that the White House was humiliated by. Did you see Elevator Girls in Bondage? I saw it later, yes. Yeah, Stephen Arnold, I knew kind of later. Michael Kalman. Oh, Michael Kalman. I'm thinking of Stephen Arnold. I saw it, but did, was that shown at the Palace? I, I'm getting it mixed up. I guess I did show that at the Palace. Elevator Girls was not shown at the Palace. It, it was wasn't. It by Michael Kalman, and it was these Elevator Girls in a hotel going on strike. I did see it, but I don't remember if it was at the Palace or it was... Were the Coquettes in that? Uh, yes. Uh-huh. Not as Coquettes, but they were. But as they're, yeah. yeah. How did that period sort of come to an end? I mean, how did you see it sort of fading out or transitioning into what followed? It came to an end, what I remember is when the Coquettes came to New York. That seemed to end it for me because it was, I was not there at their opening night because we were making a movie, maybe Pink Flamingos. I can't remember. But, you know, I've heard all the stories about, you know, the big night and everybody thought it was going to be a huge hit. And the Coquettes, you know, they never really rehearsed too well. So I think it was loose, let's say, maybe needed editing. And in New York, they weren't ready for that. They wanted, they thought it was going to be like an off-Broadway sh review or something, maybe. And so I always heard that um, um, Taylor Mead yelled out, um, what, give me Jackie Curtis, and somebody yelled out, Gore Vidal, no talent is not enough. Uh, who knows? But then I heard the other nights, it got good. Once they were here and they did it every night, I know Divine went on closing night. I never saw it in New York because I was, I guess, making Pink Flamingos or editing it or something. But it's, it seemed to me that that ended it. Um, although I knew later that the, there was Angels of Light did stuff in New York, and I heard different things about them. And then I didn't hear much. And I used to go back to San Francisco, and i push my other movies, and always say, what happened to that? I wish there was a reunion. And then somebody told me there was a reunion of the Cockettes, which I thought was great to know who was live. And, um, I, and I think it's a really, really important thing that unless you are my age and lived in San Francisco, most people don't know about today. And it was a very, very influential thing for, I guess, two years. And two years is a lot when you're in your early 20s. Uh, it could be the, maybe the best two years of some people's lives. Certainly, probably, I'm sure, were the Cockettes. There's a lot of young drag queens that are direct descendants of the Cockettes, and yet they don't know who the Cockettes were. I mean, mm -hmm. How do you think the Cockettes' legacy exists in the... In the the well, Coquettes were the first hip drag queens. Drag queens were really square before that. And Divine was one of the first hip drag queens. Divine made fun of drag queens. Drag queens hated Divine because he would come out with a chainsaw and was fat and had, like, cutouts where his gut would hang out. The old ones wanted to be Bess Meyerson, and they would steal their mother's mink coats and try to... They were straight. They wanted to be rich women, in, you know, and the Coquettes made fun of drag queens. I mean, they didn't shave their beards off. They, um, they were hippies, and hippies always were against, you know, the middle-class lifestyle. So they were the first drag, hip drag queens, and I think that's why Divine was one of the first, and they respected each other for that, of making fun of the whole idea of being a drag queen in the first place. You can't take yourself seriously and be any kind of queen. Even Queen Elizabeth has a sense of humor about herself. Maybe.